Good evening. I hope that you can all hear me. We've been having very quick lessons on how to share a PowerPoint to Facebook Live. So I'd like to welcome you here all this evening to a virtual walk in the Faulkner Cemetery. My name's Bridget and I've lived in the area for a very long time. Um, and now live across the road from the Faulkner Cemetery. Faulkner, as a suburb, has become synonymous with the cemetery. It wasn't always so. The cemetery was opened at this location in 1906, after the original Melbourne Cemetery and Melbourne General Cemetery became over full. Two new locations were opened, Springvale in 1905 and Faulkner in 1906. Faulkner was not yet a suburb, but a flat open ground with small farmlets. And the site of the cemetery was an original holding of John Pascoe Faulkner, who of course was one of the founding fathers of Melbourne. His property was called Box Forest. So tonight, I feel like I'm working in a bit of a vacuum. So I really, really would love if you would um, just respond to anything that you hear or see. If you find something a bit boring, tell me. If you find it interesting, tell me, and we can have a little discussion about that as well. But please do let us know that you're here and that you can hear me and that you can see the presentation. Thank you. So, we're going to have a virtual walk in the cemetery. The cemetery design was a commission that was won by Charles Heath. Charles Heath was a Brunswick architect who had a hand in the extension of Brunswick Town Hall. And in the design, he designed the Pith Helmeted Memorial Foyer at Coburg Town Hall. So if you ever see a photo of Coburg Town Hall or you're driving past, have a look and you'll go, hmm, that looks like a pith helmet sitting up there. That's the design that he used. For the cemetery, he used an American style of layout. It's a half spider web in design. And he said that he designed for the living. And fortunately for us today, the grounds are beautifully maintained with wonderful planting of exotic and native species of flora and encouraging a variety of birds and other small fauna uh, and the occasional kangaroo. So we leave the Faulkner Railway and we're heading west. Um, and we're going to head as far west as we can go, almost to the western border of the cemetery. So we're basically starting at the eastern border near Sydney Road and we're going to head all the way west. And on the way, we will look at some interesting and historic sites. And when we've gone as far west as we can go, I'll give you a glimpse and tell you a few tales of some interesting residents uh, that I've discovered over the years. This is my disclaimer. I'm not a historian, I'm not a photographer or cinematographer. So what I'm telling you is what I know or have found out through readily available sources. The photos and videos have all been taken on my mobile phone. This is part, in part because, well, this was done during lockdown. I haven't got a walking partner and um, I just wandered through the cemetery uh, and that was part of my exercise. Because I don't have any fancy pants equipment, I just had to do this online. Hello magpies. So this is going to be pretty much the route of our walk from that area there. Oh. 
The mortuary carriage. Um, mortuary carriage is situated as you come off the western platform of the Faulkner Railway Station. And this unusual box on wheels is designed to carry up to 20 coffins. Each coffin is played, placed in a doored compartment. In fact, there are doors on each side so that you can pop in your coffin from one direction and take it out the other. Inside each of those compartments is a roller like. So it makes it nice and easy to slide that coffin in. So we're just confirming that uh, the technology is working. So I'm glad you're all there and able to hear and see everything that's going on. Okay. So I believe we've got 17 people watching. Put your hands up. Let me know you're there. Okay, the mortuary carriage. So if you think about where we were at the start of the 20th century, cars were still a very new invention and very expensive and really not readily available. Even a horse and carriage was expensive. So people relied on public transport or Shanks's pony, walking. So you either walked or you caught the tram or you caught a bus or you caught the train. For people who lived in places like North Melbourne, Carlton, uh, Richmond, sort of inner city Melbourne, having somebody buried at Faulkner, it seemed like the ends of the earth. There really wasn't anything much beyond Coburg. It was pretty much just paddocks. And here was the cemetery. But it's because of the cemetery actually being there and requiring the transmission of families and people and mourners that the upfield railway line actually continued. Otherwise, it would have stopped. It really would have just stopped at Coburg because that's where the numbers were. And then anything beyond that was really negligible. This is a close up view of the mortuary carriage and you can see it's a little bit like a dog box with ventilation. Um, it would have been part of a train, so it would have had a locomotive and some carriages for people who were coming out to bury their family and friends. And they probably would have come with their priest from their local church. And it probably would have been on a different day. So you would have a service at a church and then have the burial on another day. And you would head out from Flinders Street Station, head out to Faulkner on a train with one of these carriages attached. There was also, uh, there was a couple of these made. I can't remember exactly how many, maybe five. Some went to Springvale and some went to Faulkner. The tea rooms. Tea rooms are interesting because it is actually a part of the original architecture of the cemetery. When Charles Heath designed the cemetery, he also designed the buildings within the cemetery. There was a small crematorium towards the back um, in a similar location to where the new crematoria are. Uh, it was a small one. It had a beautiful mural in there by an artist called Christian Waller. She was married to a man called Napier Waller. Together, they did some really spectacular work on facades around Melbourne in mosaics. And Napier Waller was also did the mosaics at the Canberra War Memorial. There's a tomb of an unknown soldier and he did that. But you can see here the tea rooms, the pagoda style roof. That was very much the style of the time. It was, it's really reflecting that arts and crafts time and des design that was starting to come in vogue. You can see the arches here around the doors. So they're long doors 
windows really that open and you can go into there you can have um, a nice cup of tea there you could have your after get together so after the your burial you would go in there and have a little get together with people but you can see those doors are surrounded by tiles they look like bricks here but they're actually really smooth they're glazed like a tile and um, that's the same sort of tile and the same sort of glazing that's used on the Manchester Unity building in Collins Street. Um, that magnificent structure that goes above the main building is actually tiled and that stops the dirt from sticking to it. It always looks gleamingly clean. Here's a cherub. This is one of a pair of lovely little cherubs. Uh, they're non-secular um, baby figures. They're not angels, which have a religious connotation, but they're non-secular and they are at the gate to the Rose Urn Garden. This was an interesting and efficient way of interring a no large number of cremated remains. So you can see in the back behind the cherub, you can see lots and lots of little squares in the wall there. And each one of those is, is an interment of a cremated remains. It, when the cemetery first started, they had maybe 75 to 95% burials and a very small number of cremation. Over the years, for reasons of convenience, and economics and probably are moving away from that really strict um, religious requirements, uh, cremations have become very much more popular. <laughs> See this beautiful tree here in the garden. The Rose Urn Garden is really lovely to visit. Uh, it's walled all the way around. It's nice and secluded in there. Uh, and you can very often have the whole space to yourself, share it maybe with a few bunny rabbits. And there's a few remnant species of tree throughout the cemetery, uh, including this really magnificent gum tree that's in that rose urn garden. I'm not sure the age of the tree. I'm not sure if it was planted or if it's remnant, but there are definitely some remnant species there dating back probably from when it was John Pascoe Faulkner's property, Box Forest. When my daughter was very, very small, she learned all of her colours in a place like this. We used to go across the road to the cemetery and name all the colours of the roses. We also counted Jesus on one hand and Mary on the other. So multitasking and just using the space because it's so beautiful and it just really should be shared. And like I said, Charles Heath did design this for the living. So this is the fountain. As you come in through the gate from Sydney Road, you will come across this fountain right in the middle of the roundabout. You can see there's quite a lot of birds. I don't think that you can hear the sounds, but the birds are just, they are going off. I'm just really enjoying the water. That fountain was erected in recognition of Charles Heath. And so we can just have a look here. We can see down the avenue there and across to Roman Catholic one. Where are we going to head now? So the Coleman Park, don't be fooled by elaborate memorials. Some of the most famous people, some of the most noteworthy people are interred here with the simplest of decorations. I'm going to skip through here. We're going to go and have a look at this beautiful fir tree here in the garden. You can see that the whole garden is spectacularly planted to make it inviting and restful. 
when I first started my excursions through the cemetery, this little fir tree was no bigger than one of those Kmart Christmas trees that you come across. And now it's a really beautifully shaped fir tree there. Sometimes in drought years, this whole area would be pitted with rabbit diggings because the poor little fellas needed something to eat. And during the drought times, this was not as green and lush as it is today. Under the tree is a plaque to John Coleman. In his short playing career, he has the second highest goal average in the history of VFL AFL football. He kicked 537 goals in 98 matches. If you want to do the math, please do tell me what that comes out. So that's 300, sorry, 537 goals over 98 matches. His playing career ended when he was only 25. He also went on to coach for Essendon. He played with Essendon from 49 to 54 and he coached from 61 to 67. John retired to Dramana. He had a pub down in Dramana. Uh, but he died there of peritonitis from an infected tooth. So a very illustrious career. My father didn't follow football, but boy, he loved John Coleman. So we're going to continue through to Roman Catholic one, which is where we will find our first burial. When I tell you that I am not a historian and that all of the information that I used is easy to access, one of my major sources of information is a site called Trove. T-R-O-V-E, which is accessed through the State Library's website or through the National Library's website. And it, it's a huge collection of digitised newspapers. When I started on this whole excursion of putting together the history of the cemetery, there wasn't a lot of those newspapers digitised. And over the years, the numbers have increased so that I've actually been able to flesh out some of the stories. This here, the remains of Gladys, Doris Gladys Knapp, five-year-old daughter of Mr. A.C. Knapp, assistant station master at Brunswick Railway Station. Doris Knapp was the first interment in Faulkner Cemetery. Doris died in August she was not buried until November. It perplexed me why that was so, but it really was that they were waiting for her to be buried at Faulkner and the cemetery was not ready at that stage. So her body, her little four-year-old body was held at jo John Allison's, John Allison, Joseph Allison, one of the Allison's, uh, at their cold store in Richmond. So, and they've continued in Sydney Road as a funeral directors. This is the site of the first burial. This is the site of the first burial. You can see uh, the front and the back. It's a family plot. So, uh, it's for side by side. So I think Dorothy had only one brother. Uh, and so this was a family plot. We can have a look here and we can understand a number of things. So we know that this area is called Roman Catholic one. So they're obviously a Catholic family. Also, the fact that they were able to purchase a plot 
of this size at that time suggests that they may have actually been relatively well off. Our research shows that Mr Knapp was the assistant station master at Brunswick and he went on to be station master for the railways. He really held a position of esteem in those days, bank managers, people in the public service, people who worked in as station masters, postmasters, they were held in esteem in, this, in their local society. There's every chance too that being a Brunswick family, maybe they even knew Charles Heath and um, perhaps he convinced them that this might be a nice idea to, to purchase this plot. Dorothy died of meningitis. They lived in Victoria Street in, in Brunswick. We can see here so that she has the cross. Uh, we have that she has the cross and leading up to the cross, we have three steps, which represents faith, hope and charity. The number three is a really, really strong number in all Christianity it rep and especially in Catholicism, it represents the Trinity, which is uh, faith, hope and uh, faith, hope and charity, the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It also represents a triangle, which of course structurally is the strongest symbol. In the crux of this very simple cross, and it's very, very, you really can't see it here, but in the right in the centre there is a, a schematic of a cherub. So a little drawing in lead, if you like, of a little cherub face here. And there's evidence right at the very top here that um, there may have been a little statuette actually sitting on the top. Um, so if you've got any questions or any comments, please do jump on the chat and let us know what you're thinking. So here's a closer picture of that chair, but I don't know if you can see just a tiny little bit of that there. And here is a photograph taken from a newspaper of the original cortege. You can see in the background the gatehouse and the horse and carriage, the glass carriage. It would have been adorned with gold and mirrors and glass. The men in attendance all had top hats. There is also a photograph available of that first burial and there is not one woman in that photograph. It's all men. Um, hi Sylve, you've asked about uh, tours in person. I have done tours in person in the past and I really enjoy it. I actually probably enjoy it more than I do doing this online. Um, I do love getting the feedback and I love seeing people's faces when I tell them stuff that I think is interesting and they feel it's interesting too. Um, so keep your eye out, Sylph, and perhaps in the future we might be able to do something in person. I'd really love it to, to be able to do it. And now that, you know, things have settled down with the COVID and all of that, hopefully if we get a good few seasons, we can get back on to doing things like walking through the cemetery. Because it's, it's great. It's a great place to visit and it's not even scary. Well, except when you fall in the mud, that's pretty scary. So, as you can see, uh, it must have been autumn when I took this photo. There's lots of interesting things to see with the trees, different times of the year, different times of the day. It's really worth going across there, experiencing the flora and the fauna uh, and the birds just, you know, sit there, take a sandwich, sit down on the grass and just enjoy the ambience and the pretty colours. So as we leave Roman Catholic one, we're going to head further west. Now we can go down the straightforward road or we can go this way. So 
So we're going to leave Roman Catholic 1, which has some great things to see, but I can't show you everything today. I've got to leave something for next time. So we're going to walk through here. And I'm just going to skip it a little bit because it really could do with a bit of an edit. So you cross this road. And I'm just going to skip along. Let's skip along. <coughs> Excuse me. It's just not going. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so... We're just going to head down here. Have a look at this great monument here. This is a lovely red granite monument. It's quite elaborate. And we can see by that style of cross that this is, again, a Catholic burial and a Roman uh, Irish burial. It has on it uh, shamrocks and it has the Celtic design. The front of it is embellished with this scroll. And that is basically the scroll that, you know, God's going to check up if you've been a good person uh, and St. Peter's going to check your name off it uh, before you head into heaven. And I'm sure there's nobody here who I won't see in heaven. So you can see, like, the family really, like, I can remember even back to my grandmother actually squirrelling away money for her funeral. Uh, it was a big thing for people. So it's quite a magnificent thing. So we're going to head away from there and we're going to continue Westwood Ho. Uh, and you can see right in the centre there a black stone set on a grey marble stone there. And that is an interment of the Good Samaritan sisters. They, I think the Good Samaritans had a convent over in Preston, Northcote. When you become a nun, you turn your back on your family, you turn your back on your life, and your life then is focused on your sisters and your community. And so even in death, the, the Good Samaritan sisters are buried together. And if we just move across a little bit here, we can see there's not one stone, there's lots of stones. Lots and lots of sisters of the Good Samaritan there. I'll just move this along a little more. Because next to the sisters of the Good Samaritans, are some really spectacular and interesting stones. So on the other side there, it's Eastern Orthodox. Now, to me, the Eastern Orthodox, it's quite familiar, but at the same time, it's a little bit different to what I know. So I can see some similarities, but I see some differences. So the shape of the stones is different. The names are certainly different and the embellishment on the cross is different to what I know. So I'm really asking anybody out there, if you know something, share it with me because these are some of the stones that I've seen. I know they're a bit different and I know that some of them represent symbols of where people have come from. The snowdrops, that funny little pointy symbol there above the man with the giant cigar. What is that? Why is he dressed like that? So if you know those answers, let me know. Share them. So here's something else that's a little different. So we can see there on one side of the screen, a sort of square type arrangement inside a diamond with some oak leaves. In most Christian symbolism, oak represents long life, steadfastness. So it would be somebody who maybe is steadfast in their faith or a steadfast friend, somebody who's actually achieved quite an age. So it's actually representing the, that sort of strength and age of a person. So it can be interpreted in a number of ways. In this case, I'm not sure exactly what the intention is. 
in some Christian burials, you will see the oak leaf also with some acorns and that represents a new beginning. So we've had the old and now it's gone back into a new life and that's the resurrection um, that people have actually started a new life on the other side. In the centre there is a really beautiful abstract sun and if you look closely, it's actually a, a crucifix with rays coming from it and underneath it. It could be a footrest, it could be the moon. I'm not 100% sure of the symbolism there. Again, if you can tell me, love to hear from you. And then, of course, wheat. Wheat very often symbolises wealth and fertility. So somebody who's done a really good wheat crop is actually doing very well for themselves. In this case, it is my suspicion that is representative of somewhere in Eastern Europe that that person has come from. So if you've got any clues, pop it in the chat. Now we're going to head into the old pioneers section. Let me just find my notes. So when Batman declared Melbourne a place for a village, I doubt he would have foreseen the extent and the speed with which that village grew. It outgrew itself many times over in a short period of time due to the discovery of gold in the northern reaches of Victoria, in central Victoria, uh, Mount Alexander, Bendigo, those sorts of things. And Melbourne became the port where people came from interstate and overseas. They landed at Port Phillip and they travelled to the gold fields. So Melbourne grew very, very quickly. It also became quite a wealthy town, um, able to provide diggers with what they required, with lodging, with alcohol, maybe a pick and shovel, maybe some transport. There is a whole lot of politics around Batman. And when I see you in person, maybe we can have a chat about that, but not today. When he made his first settlement in Melbourne, Batman settled his group uh, on Flagstaff Hill. It gave him a view out to the Yarra, out to Port Phillip. He could see the area and they were safe there from local Aboriginal groups as well uh, as what was going on in the bay and on the river. It quickly outgrew that space there. There was a small burial ground and I think there are still some remains actually on that hill there. Very quickly on, they built a new cemetery, which became the Melbourne General Cemetery, later to be known as the Old Melbourne General Cemetery. And that cemetery was at the current site of the Queen Victoria Market. If you go there, you can see some of the original walls where this cemetery was. There is an apothecary story that some of those remains were not removed. In fact, there is probably about 10,000 bodies or part thereof still under the tarmac at the Queen Victoria market. So when you go there and you buy your cauliflower, just have a think about that. But do go and have a look at the old wall there and jump onto Trove and put in Old Melbourne Cemetery and have a look at some of the photos and some of the stories around that cemetery. So it was quite a big cemetery. Anybody who was not a Christian, who was not of the faith, was buried outside the walls. Aboriginals, Chinese, Jews were all buried outside of the walls. Only Christians were allowed to be buried inside. And that's the discussion we'll have later. This here, I did have a narration online, but you can't hear that. So I'll tell you what it says. This is in memory of William Stevenson. He was 22 years of age. I, this stone was erected by John Stevenson. What's really interesting is that William Stevenson died on the 6th of the 3rd, 1843 on the Bark Heroin. It was an accident was accidentally drowned on the bar heroin. Look it up, see if you can find out. I couldn't actually find anything about the bark 
heroin. See if you can find out some of that information. Stones with these inscriptions, they carry a lot of information. You've just got to draw it out and use trove, use anything you can get your hands on. Dig out and find out what happened on the bark heroin that caused uh, young William Stevenson to be drowned. This is another one that has we will come. just skip through. Skip through William Stevenson. Hello, William. Um, so this one's quite interesting. So we've got the Manchester Unity symbols here and the hand with the heart. I'm not 100% sure of that symbol, but it looks pretty cool. And the M and the U is for Manchester Unity, which was, I think, like a Masonic sort of thing. Um, it may have been where they came from. What I found really interesting that this stone was erected to the memory of John Shanks by his wife, whose name was Elizabeth Shields. Hmm, why is her name different? Did she remarry? It said she was his wife. Maybe she reverted to her maiden name. Maybe that was her maiden name. It's interesting. And there's that hand there with the heart in it, which I think is the symbol of the Manchester unity. Just so how this happened was the cemetery uh, outgrew itself. They built a new cemetery at Carlton and that outgrew itself as well. The Faulkner Cemetery came online in 1906 and in 1920, most of the graves from Melbourne, old Melbourne Cemetery, the first Melbourne Cemetery, were dug up and relocated here. As you can see, it's really just headstones. There's very little of surrounds. Uh, Victorian and Edwardian graves very often had uh, grave surrounds with maybe some wrought iron posts and some twisted barley style wrought iron around it as well. But these are the, these are the graves of the first pioneers, the first generation of people that came to Melbourne. Sorry. Well, we were going to have a look at that. Let's see if we can go back. No, we're just going to look at something else instead. So this is another really nice looking stone here. You can see uh, lots of different symbols that are used here. A lot of these stones are very soft. Some of them have not survived these past 150 years. This is, and you can see behind it there. Yeah, where's my thing? Let me just zip behind you there. To this one here, love it. This is made of cast iron. It's covered with lichen. It's a tabletop design here. It was actually manufactured overseas and it would have been shipped out. So very often these were people who had come to Australia as young men and come away from their family. They've come to make their fortune. They're maybe sailors, as we saw previously, or maybe they have come for the gold, to the gold fields. Maybe they're merchants. Maybe they are going to work and try and make their fortune in that respect. This was made at a place in, called Stockton on Tees, which is somewhere in the north of England. It is in Middlesbrough in North Yorkshire, Stockton on Tees. As far as preservation of monuments, anything that is covered with lichen, you're better off leaving it. Don't peel the lichen off. Lichen has very deep and very destructive roots. Pretty much you can't see them, and you know, but they get into the material and they will actually destroy it. But if you take it off, then you've removed that outer covering and you've also removed part of the stone. 
So all the conservators will say, unless you really know what you're doing, leave the lichen there, leave it in situ. At least it will preserve a certain amount of that there. So um, it's hard to look at something like this and go, oh, if only we took all that lichen off, we'd be able to read it really well. That'd be really cool. But unless you... <clears throat> So here we are, we've pretty much gone as far west as we can in the cemetery. Now we have sort of skipped a few places and we've skipped quite a lot of the old pioneers, but I don't want to bore you too much. We'll talk about it another time. This here is a mosaic that was to uh, people affected by war, essentially people who actually gave themselves to the war. So some of them are soldiers some of them are land girls, some of them are women who were left at home, who lost their sons, who lost their husbands. So there were people who served in the war in all sorts of ways. This mosaic was done by an artist called he Helen Bodycomb in 2006. And that's as far west as we can go. But now we're going to skip all over the place. We're going to go now. This is the Jewish pioneers. As I was saying before, with the Christian burials, uh, they were done inside the pioneers cemetery. But the Jewish people were actually buried outside of it. They moved to uh, exhume and relocate the bodies. It was done in the Victorian Parliament and it was done, it was pretty much rushed through because the Jewish people really, really didn't want their ancestors and their people moved from where they were interred. Uh, it's a one-stop activity. You just stay in peace where you are buried. So it really was a huge, huge deal, but it was done as a political move through Parliament uh, at night. Again, jump onto Trove, that's T-R-O-V-E, and uh, just have a look at that. You'll find lots of information there about that. So this is up in the southeast corner of the cemetery, so quite a long way from where we were at the mosaic, and quite a long way from the old pioneers area. There's nothing really much I can say about it. Um, it's not a particularly pleasant space. But quite behind it is um, a, quite a nice Jewish cere uh, part of the, the cemetery. And there interred is Issy Smith. Uh, and he was a recipient of the Victoria Cross during World War I. There are very few recipients of the Victoria Cross and at Faulkner, there were only two interred here. And that was Issy Smith and I forget his first name, Rushall. But he, I think, has been moved. I couldn't find him anywhere. But Issy Smith is here. And his history is really, really interesting. So he was very young. He was born for, from French parents in Egypt. So they were working in Egypt. He got to be about 11 years old and he stowed himself on a ship and took off and found himself in London, England. And he set himself up a life there, working in the East End of London. He then, at the first available opportunity, he joined the British Army. He joined uh, the Manchester Regiment uh, and volunteered into the British Army in 1904. He then emigrated to Australia, but then in 1914, as a reservist, he joined again the, the Manchester Regiment and he was dispatched as Corporal Smith to Wipers in France. He was awarded the VC for the most conspicuous bravery on April 26th 1915 near Wipers when he left his company 
on his own initiative and went forward to the enemy's position to assist a severely wounded man whom he carried the distance of 250 yards to safety whilst exposed the whole time to heavy machine gun and rifle fire. Subsequently, Corporal Smith displayed great gallantry when casualties were very heavy, involuntarily assisting to bring in many more wounded men throughout the whole day and attending them with the greatest devotion to duty, regardless of personal risk. This is Issy Smith in 1927. You can see he has a chest full of medals there. He also won the French Croix de Guerre and the Russian Cross of St. George fourth class. After the war, Smith had a long and varied career until his death. He and his wife Elsie and their two children lived in Mooney Ponds and he was buried with full military honours. Heading away from there, we're going to have a look at this. Oh dear me, somebody's knocked the top off that pillar. No, they didn't because this is a memorial erected to a man, a very young man who was killed in the line of his work. He was a police constable uh, in North Melbourne. And on Christmas Eve, I seem to have lost half of my notes. Christmas Eve, he met with a couple of his mates who were undercover police officers, and they met in Victoria Street. Now, there was a group of Italian migrant workers it seems that perhaps the young men may have riled up that group of men. And one of those men, Dominic Condello, a 33 year old quarryman, was arrested for the stabbing death of young Constable James Clare. This is the tribute. He was 25 years of age but it was Christmas Eve, which is just horrible. But reading the newspapers, it sort of answered some questions for me. And it really seemed that perhaps the young men really did agitate that group of workers. I think there was quite a lot of ill feeling uh, with migrants in that area at the time. Some of those people would have been working at the market. There would have been quite a strong community there. But again, young single men coming to Australia to make a fortune for themselves and then perhaps bring out family uh, later. Dominic Candelo was actually found not guilty of the murder of James Clare. They could not prove any intent. And it's quite a habit to actually stand and peel fruit with a small knife. And Condello said that James Clare uh, in the scuffle fell on the knife. It was never his intention to stab James Clare. Okay, so this is an old photograph and it's a little bit dodgy because it's pretty much a photo of a photo. But this is a grave that I stumbled upon uh, it's on the other side of the main entrance from where we have come. This is a picture of a grave. Um, it was interesting. The shape to me was interesting and the inscription was interesting. And I did a little bit of research and I came up with this picture. So that original grave uh, had a little statuette of a boy in shorts little raggedy boy standing there. And you can see there the words that were on that grave there. This is a really, truly interesting story. And I would say to you, grab yourself a copy of Young Digger. It's called Young Digger. And it is written by Anthony Hill. And it tells the story of young Henri Emine, 
who became Henri Emin Tovel. Uh, he was a little fella who was possibly orphaned uh, and he was in the, the fields of, outside the fields of fighting in France. It was a pretty desolate sort of place, but they, um, there was a flying, not a flying corps, who would you call it? So it was a squadron of engineers who looked after the aeroplanes and things um, there. So Henri became very good friends with the people there. He first of all befriended the British. He escaped from the nuns in the orphanage and he befriended a group of British engineers. The British left the area. They took Henri back to the orphanage. He then escaped the orphanage because he really didn't like it. And he took up with this man. This man's name is Tim Tovell. Tim Tovell became an honorary guardian of Henri. Tim was in the area with his brother and they looked after young Digger. They, as you can see there, they made him a little cut down uniform. And it was his job to take his cart laden with explosives and he would go up and down the airstrip and blow up the rats nests and keep the rats off the airstrip and he might have been six he might have been eight he might have been nine but he was very very small he had actually pretty much been living pretty rough and living by himself you can see there tim holding an oat sack what did he do Ah, so somebody's asked a question um, about Henri's family. He was never known. Uh, he was living with the nuns. I don't, they don't know if he may have been an abandoned child. Uh, his parents may have killed, been killed. There really is no way of knowing. I think that time in France, I think things were probably pretty messy and Henri would not have been the only war orphan living in uh, those orphanages there. This is Henri later in life. So Henri, if we can go, can we go back, we can go back. So you can see Tim there is holding an oat sack. So when the squadron was shipped back to Australia via England, the squadron secreted young Henri inside one of these oat sacks and Tim carried that sack across his shoulder. Nothing to see here. Oh, what do you mean? I've just got stuff in that sack. Nothing very interesting. But he had young Henri in that sack and he smuggled him to Australia. But of course, he's an illegal immigrant, so he has no papers. But Tim lived in Queensland and he took Henri and there he is there, a young dapper man with his sister who was probably being born before Tim went to France and his two younger siblings. And I know for a fact that they all just thought of Henri as their brother. They didn't talk about him as being their French brother or their adopted brother. He was a Tovel as far as they were concerned. So Henri, all he wanted to do was fly aeroplanes. He just wanted to join the RAAF. But they lived on a farm in Queensland. Tim contacted his commanding officer who was working and living in Melbourne. He worked at Victoria Barracks in St Kilda Road. And he contacted him and asked him to foster young Digger and young Digger went to Melbourne in the care of the commander. Of course, he couldn't be employed in the RAF, but he was employed as a messenger boy. So he might have been 17, he might have been 19, he might have been 21. We don't really, really know. And Henri ran messages around Melbourne for 
uh, the soldiers uh, and the commanders and the RAF people and whoever else was at the barracks. So that was his job. And he had a motorbike and he tootled around Melbourne. One day he went to visit his girlfriend in Spring Street. He had to go and deliver a message. So he did a U-turn in Spring Street and he was killed in a collision with a taxi. He was a young man who had a tragic life, who was taken in by the kindest man, whose wife was must have been the kindest wife to actually write to her husband and say, yes, of course, one more child. That's fine, just bring him home, we'll look after him. But, he, but young Digger was then interred in Faulkner Cemetery. He was interred very quickly. The commander actually lived over in Glen Iris, somewhere over in that way. So it was a long way from Faulkner. Young uh, Henry was interred there without the knowledge of his family, who were informed much, much later. Uh, so thank you, Leah. So there's a little Henry Cafe in Thornbury, which could be where I go on Friday, which will be my day off. So thank you, Leah. That's really exciting. And I hope that you've read the book because um, the whole story is really interesting and really, really hard to believe, but it's it's all true. And that little girl who has Henri's shoulders, uh, hands on her shoulders by Henri, I have met that lady. I met her very, very much later because one day I decided to find out what was going on with that grave. And so I contacted the cemetery and they said oh it's owned by it's I'm all over the place so <laughs> it's owned by uh the state trustees we don't own it so they I contacted the state trustees and they found that the RAAF association was actually the holder of young on Ree's grave uh and I said, it's in a parlour state. It's terrible. It has been vandalised. The pieces have been stolen from there. And it was then that I found out that Henri had been buried without the knowledge of his family. And they were only told after it had occurred. So going backwards and forwards with the RAAF Association, they found some money that was gifted to them by the government or, you know, to spend on a, an interesting project. And they made a new stone for Henri. And they put on there, who plucked this flower, the master. The gardener held his peace. And that's the words that Tim Tovell wanted for his son. And his sister, the young woman, the young child who he's holding, that little girl there with those beautiful golden curls, she came as a very old lady to the dedication of the new stone and she was became the Tovel representative to young diggers rededication so it's a really really interesting story and the fact that the guys just popped him in a sack and just brought him to australia and that was all okay And I am thinking, ladies and gentlemen, that that may be the end of our little tour of the cemetery tonight. I really hope that you've enjoyed it. I really would like you to go and find these places. Uh, if you'd like, perhaps maybe I can find some sort of map and make out some sort of a map. But I really think that just wandering around, interestingly, and finding information on stones jumping onto Trove, jumping onto the old Googles and finding as much information as you can because you can spend all day in the old Pioneer area and just take down some information. Technology allows us to actually sit in that space now and uh, try and find information online straight away. And so it's up to you now. You're all historians. You're all archaeologists. 
I send you forth. Go forth. And I really hope that you've totally enjoyed the tonight's presentation. I'd love to thank uh, Barbara for making me do it and for assisting me today. And I'd like to thank Alberto for actually making the technology work. And so uh, keep going with the comments. And if you're interested in anything else, please put in the comments any answers that I can give, I will. And I will attempt over the next few weeks, perhaps to map out some of the areas. Uh, if you enjoyed the talk, if there's parts that you'd like to go back and reinvestigate, or if you'd like to refer it to your friends who might have an evening spare with nothing to do, it's saved to YouTube, to the Moreland Library channel. So jump 